I'm trying to be as Jamie. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Quigley. I'm the director of the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance. Uh, thanks so much for uh, for coming. We're delighted you're here. Uh, we start today by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I think we're having a bit of an issue with our live stream right now, so we are going to record the event and uh, that will be available on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. Uh, and perhaps it will uh, come on during the event itself, so we'll, we'll hope to, to have the live streaming on. But we're, we are recording. So, um, on that uh, note, I'm going to just say a quick word about a political event we have scheduled for next Monday uh, evening. We have an event called The Road Ahead, a political conversation about the future of Atlantic Canada. That's next Monday, September 23rd. It starts at 7 p.m. It's occurring in the Irving Auditorium, which is in the Richard Murray Design Building on Morris Street on the Sexton campus. So that's not this campus. It's about maybe 10, 15 minute walk from here. It's near the city library, okay? So it's the Sexton campus on Morris Street, Irving Auditorium, Richard Murray Design Building. The Road Ahead, a political conversation about the future of Atlantic Canada. The talk will feature uh, the former Premier Daryl Dexter, Janice Harvey, longtime activist from the Green Party, the Honorable Peter McKay, and the Honorable Anne McClellan. Uh, I, I know that some of the first year MPA students will struggle with the concept of policy. What is policy? And I said to you at the beginning on the first week that I'm not entirely sure what policy is, so don't ask me. Uh, but you better get it sorted out by the end of term, but with, by the term test, right? But I don't actually know what it is myself. I continue to struggle with what is policy. It's a complicated subject. But what I can tell you is you're going to get a feel for it. Next Monday, policy is on the table. I mean, we're really going to be talking policy with some very experienced politicians and they're going to be putting forward and advocating for different positions and, and thoughts about specific policy areas. So I encourage you all to come and bring a friend. I think it'll be a, an excellent event. It's also going to be an excellent event. Next week, on Tuesday, we're talking about the future of work, and we have an excellent panel lined up for next Tuesday at 12 o'clock. Today's panel, also a very exciting subject, and it will be chaired by Jamie Baxter from the Schulich School of Law. Jamie is an associate professor at the law school, where he studies land and property, agriculture, and food systems governance, primarily at the local level. He's been active in cultivating the food of the field of food law in Canada, and much of his current work focuses on how communities, organizations, farms, and firms engage with law and confront legal barriers to build more sustainable food systems. He studied economics and law at McMaster University, the University of Toronto, and Yale, and has been a Canada-US Fulbright Scholar at the Appalachian Centre University of Kentucky. Please join me in welcoming Jamie Baxter. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here this afternoon. Um, thanks to the McKechnie Institute for, for uh, hosting an event uh, on, on this important set of issues. Um, so I won't say too much by way of introduction. Uh, we can want to get right to the panel this afternoon, except to lay out uh, a bit of a contrast for you, which I think frames uh, the discussion for today. So as many of you will know, uh, the right to food uh, is uh, uh, part of international human rights law and calls on states' parties, including Canada, uh, to ensure that all people are free from hunger and that they have uh, physical and economic access at all times to sufficient, uh, nutritious, and culturally appropriate food that is sustainably produced. And as many of you will know, uh, hunger, ending hunger, uh, is number two on the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, list, goals that Canada uh, has adopted as part of the 2030 agenda. And here's the contrast, yet, right, one in eight Canadian households, that's over four million people in Canada are food, uh, or is food insecure, uh, diet-related chronic diseases are increasing, farmers and fishers uh, often find themselves locked into unsustainable systems of globalized food production, and climate change is threatening the food supply, food production, and traditional ways of life for many communities across the country. So these interconnected set of problems indicate that our food system, I think, is failing. Um, and yet a quick scan, and maybe here's the last part of the contrast, of, um, I looked at the CBC News website this morning in their federal election primer. It's very difficult to find food uh, and food issues located anywhere there on the federal election agenda. So our four speakers for today are going to discuss uh, challenges and opportunities for our current food systems from the perspective of health, um, sustainability, economic development, 
corporate responsibility, and law. And this is the basic question that I think each is going to speak to, uh, and it is what policy levers are available to build a more fair, affordable, sustainable, uh, and healthy food system for Atlantic Canada. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce the speakers uh, in turn. Uh, I'll call on them, they'll have about 10 minutes or so to speak, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Dr. Megan Bailey. Uh, she's an assistant professor and Canada Research Chair with the Marine Affairs Program here at the, uh, Dalhousie University. Her work focuses on sustainable fishing uh, and sustainable seafood consumption with the aim of promoting uh, an equitable and ethical seafood sector and achieving seafood so uh, sovereignty for priority communities. Uh, so Megan leads the Ocean Frontier Institute uh, Economic Systems Indicator Model. Uh, she serves in the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee for the International Pole and Line Foundation, and she co-leads the Access to Resources theme uh, for the Oceans Canada uh, Partnership. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, Megan Bailey, thanks. Thank you. Am I to... Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, good afternoon. Um, I first started having some conversations um, with Kevin and Jamie uh, three years ago about food policy. And at the time I thought, I uh, like, had major imposter syndrome about the fact that I don't really do food policy, I do fish policy. <clears throat> um, and then Jamie's kind of positioned this as like, but what if you put a food lens on fish policy? And that's actually totally transformed the way I think about my research. Uh, and so today what I want to talk to you about is when is fish policy food policy? If we're not taking fish out of the ocean for food, why are we taking it out of the ocean? <coughs> so just to kind of zoom in again on what Jamie said in terms of, of food being a human right. Um, and so we don't talk about this as a policy priority just because it's a, an idealistic goal. It's, it's a fundamental human right. Um, and that means that we want to have food that's available, so sufficient food on the market, um, that it has to be accessible with physical and economic access, and it has to be adequate, so it needs to be uh, satisfying dietary needs, being safe, and being culturally um, appropriate. In this picture here, you can see some salt, uh, salted cod drawing on a clothesline. <coughs> Ginny Boudreau from the Guysbury County uh, Fishermen's Association gave a talk in May, and she talked about clotheslines as these indicators um, of a healthy food system in her fishing communities. Every house used to have two clotheslines, one for clothes and one for fish, uh, and we don't see that anymore. And for her, that's an indicator that local seafood is not being found in her community. Um, and so the question that kind of runs in my mind is, is, is that a food policy issue or is that a fisheries policy issue? Why, you know, we catch a lot of fish, particularly in Atlantic Canada. So why do we not have access to eating that fish? Is that a food thing or a fish thing? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, uh, about that today. <clears throat> so fish policy is food policy, but I guess I also want to say when is Arctic policy uh, food policy and when is it fish policy? Um, last week, Canadian government came out with the Arctic policy framework uh, and I'm just going to read a quote from that. In 2017, the Nunatsiavu government household food security survey identified that food insecure households in Nunatsiavu are over four times the level reported in Newfoundland and Labrador and over five times the level of food security uh, in Canada overall. <clears throat> so when we're talking about Arctic policy, we're talking about food policy, and certainly we can't talk about Arctic policy without thinking about the natural resources found in the ocean. Um, what is this place I speak of, Nunatsiavut? Uh, it's a very interesting geopolitical place because of where it exists, that kind of this nexus between Atlantic Canada and the Inuit regions. Um, of Canada. So on the left-hand side, you can see a map of what's called Inuit Nunungat. These are the Inuit regions of Canada. Um, starting in the west, we have the Inuvialuit settlement region, Nunavut, Nunavik, and Nunatsiavut. So Nunatsiavut is an Inuit-governed area in Canada, the first that we have. Um, it was formed in 2005 as a government, and it also is in the northern part of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. So it's both part of Atlantic Canada and kind of beholden and subject to uh, provincial uh, policies around food and fish, but then it's also subject to Arctic uh, issues like that Arctic policy framework that I raised. Um, this is from a Facebook page for the community of, May of Nain, which is the most northern community in Nunatsiavut. About 1,200 people live there. Uh, the conservative candidate was coming through and wanted to ask people what were their priorities. 
um, within this community. So you can see food security comes up very high uh, as the most kind of pulled. Also, I want to comment I didn't go into the future of October 12th to find this information. This, I, don't, I don't know where that came from, but that was September 12th. September is always a rough month for professors at the university, so maybe I'm like trying to live in October already. I don't know. Um, but this is from September 12th. So these are the responses that we were seeing. So um, to get to Nain and to get food to Nain, it has to come by, by air or by ship. So you can't really talk about food security in a place like Nain without also talking about ferry service and air service. How does food get there? Um, but then obviously things like um, access to healthcare and the overall cost of living are important as well for achieving food security. Um, what I want to touch on is climate change, just for one second, which is to say if we go back to that Arctic policy framework from the Canadian government, climate change is mentioned 34 times, food security is mentioned eight times. So this policy framework is really talking about the issues of climate change in the Arctic with a minor reference on food security, and actually three of those eight times food security is mentioned in the context of climate change. So climate change is going to impact food security uh, in the Arctic. That's true. I don't think anyone would say that's not true. But we have food insecurity now, which is not a result of climate change. So why do we have food insecurity in the north? Um, and what kinds of policies can help that? And where can fish policy play a role in that? Um, we know that Canada's new food guide came out, a beautiful colorful plate. The protein section shows one type of fish and seafood product, which is Arctic char. Um, Arctic char looks like this as a fish. That was me three weeks ago. I was very happy to catch my first Arctic char, <laughs> as you can see in that photo. Um, Arctic char is a salmonid, <clears throat> so it's related to salmon uh, in a similar way. It spends part of its life in the ocean and part of its life in lakes and rivers, and that becomes important. <clears throat> so Northern Labrador had a very vibrant char fishery in the 1970s and 1980s. They were catching over 300,000 pounds of, of char. Um, there was full employment in the processing plan, including the employment of 64 women, and uh, that was for three months of the year during the fishing season. Uh, what fishermen would do is they would pack their whole family up in their boat, and they would head north in this like beautiful complex of islands and fjords and bays and rivers, and they would fish for char for three months on, on the land, basically. Um, this doesn't happen anymore. So what we saw three weeks ago when we were up there is they're barely catching 22,000 pounds, uh, so less than 10% of what they were catching before. The plant is open for a few hours a day, um, and there are only four boats currently fishing commercially. Um, so I want to talk about why that is. Again, uh, what does this have to do with food? What does it have to do with fish? And, and where does policy fit into this? So we were up there to speak with the community and listen uh, to their kind of concerns about the fishery, uh, char being one part of that, but all fisheries. And we heard a number of reasons for why they think there's such a low catch. Um, so number one is because there used to be a salmon fishery and there used to be an Atlantic cod fishery. Uh, the salmon fishery was closed in 1987, the cod fishery in 1992. Um, the economic package that went to compensating fishermen across Atlantic Canada when the cod fishery collapsed uh, was not accessible to fishermen in northern Labrador. So they didn't receive any compensation. So two big fisheries ended for them. Maybe there's more pressure on char because of that. We also heard from the community that policies around sealing and seal hunting um, have meant that there are now more seals around eating the char. They think that might be a problem. Um, you know, one of the fishermen we talked to said the government is worse than Greenpeace um, in terms of trying to characterize how conservative uh, they are. But then we also know that there's a major access to capitalization uh, of the fishery. And so there are only four boats that currently fish. Um, previously, there were collector boats that would go up to where all of these camps were and collect the char that had been fished, right? So you could spend your three months up at your camp fishing, and someone would come and collect that fish from you and bring it back to the processing plant. That doesn't happen anymore, uh, which means that as a fisherman, you have to come in and out the same day. So you can only go a certain distance from Nain Bay. Um, in the wintertime, fishermen are getting on their skidoos and they're driving to these lakes, and they're finding big char and lots of char. And so they're really concerned because they're saying there's tons of char out there. We just, we can't get it. And that's frustrating as a fisherman. It's frustrating as a plant manager, but it's also frustrating as a community member. So the char fishery in Nain is the only char fishery in the region. And it basically is supposed to fill the community freezers across all of Nunatsiavid in the five communities. The community freezers are places where elders, for example, can come and get access to country foods. 
So when the char fishery goes down, that's a big problem for the entire region. So, but again, these are not necessarily food policy failures, they're fisheries policy failures. So when is fish policy a food policy? Um, so I'd say when it impacts on human rights, um, that right to food, when it reinforces historical and colonial powers. So the fact that we have an Inuit governed region that still is beholden to the Minister of Fisheries uh, decision making process, those powers impact um, where fish and food intersect. And then it results in inequitable outcomes. So what we need to think through from a fisheries policy perspective are policies that support fish as part of a regenerative food system. So that's a, you know, fish and a fishery that doesn't just take from the ecosystem but puts back to communities and puts back to ecosystems. And we think about how does that fishery actually contribute to a community um, as opposed to just continuing to a globalized trade um, or some kind of seafood production factory. Um, and that these kinds of fisheries policies can help us attain the right to food for all Canadians. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, thanks very much. Our second speaker uh, for today is uh, Sarah Kirk. Uh, Sarah uh, is a professor of health promotion at the School of Health and Human Performance uh, and scientific director of the Healthy Populations uh, Institute here at Dow. Uh, Sarah's uh, research explores the ways uh, to create supportive environments for chronic disease prevention through policy and systems change, and she does this by applying a social ecological lane, uh, lens or approach uh, that takes into account how individual behavior is influenced uh, by other broader factors such as income, uh, education, uh, and societal norms. Uh, so she's uh, led several nationally funded projects that focus on food and acti uh, food in the activity environment within schools and communities, including um, Uplift, uh, a well-known provincial partnership focused on youth uh, leadership change. Uh, Sarah, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different lens to uh, the one that uh, um, Megan just did and uh, really start to get us to think about that fair, affordable, sustainable health, health system that we, we need to see created and what it means to each and every one of us in this room. I'm going to start with the words of uh, jean Briard Savarin, who said in the 19th century, tell me what you eat and I will tell you what we are or what you are. And if we are what we eat, because that's really essentially what he was saying, then what are we? In many parts of the world, what we are is overfed, but undernourished. Our food supply is abundant for some, but insufficient for others. We buy too much food, and we throw too much food away. In fact, in Canada, around $31 billion of food is wasted every year. And yet, as we've heard from, uh, from Megan, over 4 million Canadians um, or 4 million Canadian households experience some degree of food insecurity. And according to re that's according to research from Proof, which is an inter interdisciplinary research group from the University of Toronto, and my colleague uh, Dr. Maher is also a member of that research group. And I think probably we'll speak a little bit more about some of these things. And we have many more types of food available to us than our parents or grandparents did. Yet we know less than ever about how our food gets from farm to fork. We no longer routinely teach our children about food preparation, and nor is it valued within our own day-to-day -day lives. In many ways, we've actually relegated food to the rip of a packet or a box, or the ping of a microwave. But whether we value it or not, or whether we realize it or not, food actually dominates our lives. We actually make 200 food decisions every day. Uh, things about like what, uh, what to eat, when, with whom, and at what cost. And we're all paying for the chronic diseases that arise from unhealthy eating, which according to the Canadian Disease Prevention um, Alliance of Canada was around $26 billion per year in 2015. Meanwhile, the Public Health Agency of Canada puts the direct cost of chronic diseases at around 58% of annual sickness care spending in our country. That is unsustainable. So given that health care or sickness care is routinely one of the top concerns for Canadians when it comes to elections, food really should be a hot potato political issue, shouldn't it? 
And it almost was in the summer when federal conservative leader Andrew Scheer claimed that chocolate milk saved his son's life <laughs> while slamming Canada's recently released food guide for what he and the food industry argued was a lack of consultation on its development. And it almost was back in 2012 when Olivier de Chutter, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, condemned Canada over what he saw as unacceptable rates of food insecurity because one in 10 families with a child under six in Canada is unable to meet their daily needs, their daily food needs. Of course, that um, comment by, um, by Olivia de Chatter actually then prompted a retort from Jason Kenney, the federal Im immigration minister of the day, who basically said that de Chatter was wasting UN, the UN's money by giving lectures to wealthy and developed countries like Canada instead of focusing on the developing countries requiring the food aid that Canada actually provides. How dare he point a finger at us? And it really should have been an issue back in 2010 when the Shutter noted that the food systems that we have inherited from the 20th, 20th century have actually failed. If his observations had been taken more seriously back in uh, 2010, we might actually be having a different discussion right now. So as someone who was trained in nutrition and who now researches how our physical, social and economic environments help or hinder our ability to adopt health behaviours, food matters to me because the food we eat has the potential to cause or cure a host of societal ills. The food system failure described by De Shutter in 2010 shows up in my work through better understanding a food environment that does not value health and indeed often seems intentionally designed to undermine it, to drive overconsumption and to do that in the pursuit of profit. We are at the very definition of consumers when it comes to the food environment that we um, currently have. And if you really think about it, we could actually say that healthy eating is abnormal. My collaborative research has identified some of the ways that our modern health disrupting food environment sets us up for healthy food choice failure. Yet the finger of blame inevitably points to individual behavior as being the problem and the solution. You just need to eat less and move more. Ignore that donut, that burger or cheesecake. Never mind that it's precisely formulated to light up your brain like cocaine. You just need more willpower. And I could talk at length at the reasons for this food system failure, from industrialization through to the commodification and consolidation of our food supply within a small group of large companies. We now have a food system that is dominated by energy dense, nutrient poor food options that are heavily marketed, cheap to produce, and in many cases, yeah, delicious. But I only have limited time and we're tasked with offering solutions to address the food system failure. For me, the release of Canada's newest version of the food guide earlier this year offers an opportunity to press that reset button and, uh, on our relationship with food and to redefine what we want and need from the food system of the future. Never mind fast food, I'm talking about fast food, hashtag fast food, <laughs> which means a food system that is fair affordable, sustainable, and healthy. Fair means a food system where there, in which there is social and economic value for all. Affordable means a food system where nourishing food is available and accessible to everyone, regardless of income. Sustainable means a food system that is aligned with our societal goals for sustainable development and the health and well-being of our planet, as well as the people living on it. And healthy means a food system that is safe and meets the nutritional needs of everyone. A fair, affordable, sustainable and healthy food system is one that nourishes our bodies and our minds. It has value and is valued and it doesn't cost the earth. A food system that works for everyone so that no one is left behind. And whatever we do locally or globally, we must keep these principles in mind. But it is no easy task to redesign our food system and action is needed across multiple levels um, of the system to achieve this. And there are three key actions that I would like to outline that each and every one of us can take to support that ideal of a food fair, affordable, sustainable and healthy food system. The first action is to reclaim food as a basic human right. Because as we've heard, the right to food is already enshrined in international law. This doesn't mean free food for everyone, but rather that we all have the physical and economic access at all times to adequate food or the means for its procurement. 
and we could do more to embed the right to food into legal frameworks, national policies and strategies, and these approaches have actually been applied in many other countries, most notably in Africa, Latin America, and South Asia. The first ever food policy for Canada, announced in the 2019 budget, is a step in the right direction. But it is vulnerable to shifting political priorities and vested commercial interests. We need to protect the integrity of the food policy process if we're actually going to see it to have the impact that it, uh, that it could do. The second action is to restore food as a common good, which means challenging that prevailing free market economy and recognizing the market failures that magnify inequities rather than reducing them, and that are illustrated in things like the higher cost of healthy food compared to the less healthy food. Key to this shift is thinking in, in is, is this shift in thinking is challenging the notion of value for money and adopting paradigm um, of values for money that recognizes and celebrates food as a public good. This doesn't mean we have to turn back the clock to a time when we were more connected with food than we are now, but we can relearn how to value food more. It means focusing on value for health and uh, valuing the people who produce our, our food. And this leads to the third action, which is to reconnect with where our food comes from and how it is produced. If we accept the notion of, of food as a common good, then by extension, we should view nutritious food as a common good as well. This means encouraging greater personal and societal investment in how our food is sourced and its impact on other resources, as mentioned by Megan, land use, environmental stewardship, and supporting the economic viability of our food producers. When we view food as a common good, it becomes everyone's responsibility, and we owe it to each other to protect the societal resource. Similarly, it could be argued that protecting individual health is a common good, which aligns with the historical context of policies and practices, such as those that underpin Canada's food, first food guide introduced in the 1940s. In media campaigns for this guide, the focus was not only on the production, but also the consumption of healthy foods, with the slogan, eat right, Feel right, Canada needs you strong. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Sarah. I love uh, hashtag fast food. Uh, I like it so much it might actually cause me to become a Twitter user uh, just so that I can put it out there. Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, Catherine Ma. Uh, Kathy is a Canada Research Chair in Promoting Healthy Populations and an Associate Professor uh, in the School of Health Administration uh, here at Dalhousie. Uh, Kathy directs the Food Policy Lab, a multidisciplinary uh, program of research on the environment and policy determinants of diet with a focus on health promoting uh, innovations in the food system. Uh, she's also appointed at the Dalai Lama, uh, uh, Dalai Lama School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and her current research is supported by uh, CIHR, uh, SHRC, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, and the Australian National Health and Medical uh, Research Council. Professor Ma. been issued, <laughs> we're ready to go, and what if I told you that the next Government of Canada could prevent one in six deaths, could protect one in five households with kids in Atlantic Canada, cut hunger by half for working families, eliminate 49% of the healthy years of life currently lost to cardiovascular disease, and make 70 cents of every household food dollar count towards health, and make 2.3 million jobs the absolute best jobs in Canada. 
What do you think? <laughs> Is somebody coming to the door with that? What would you say? What if I told you that we could accomplish all of this through food? Sound good? <laughs> Sound pretty good? Well, I hope you would, somebody in the room would call me out on this and say, that's magical thinking. <laughs> so let's not do that, and let's do <laughs> policy making instead. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get down to business, and I'm gonna take you grocery shopping with me. So a lot of my research is on the retail food environment, and this is a community that we worked in uh, in Toronto, in the Toronto area. Um, anybody from Ontario? of people. This is uh, Lothodon Pathway. So this is in Toronto's uh, Lawrence Heights, uh, Yorkdale, Glen Park uh, area. It's considered a priority neighborhood. Uh, uh, health risks are spatially concentrated here. There's a high proportion of newcomers. There's a mix of residential and industrial land uses, so it's pretty hard to uh, get anywhere on foot. Public transit is not great. So. In Lothogen Pathway, there's a couple of grocery stores that are within, within walking distance of this apartment tower complex. And this uh, neighborhood has a much higher proportion of uh, residents, pri private residences in multi-unit uh, above five-story dwellings. Um, so the closest discount grocery, however, is 2.5 kilometers away, which by any standard wouldn't be considered walkable. So if you lived in Lothogen Pathway, how would you get to the grocery store? Any, any suggestions? Bike. Bike, okay. <laughs> yeah. Car. Car, okay, that's another option if you have a car, right? Bus, bus. yeah, if you can wait for the bus, if you can carry your groceries. A cab well, if you a cab if you can afford it, great, okay. So let me tell you how people in Lothian Pathway actually get to the grocery store. They make a choice that is perfectly logical and rational in this neighborhood environment. And they dig deep, they consider their time and their budget and their lack of access to a vehicle, and they make the choice that they need to do. So this story of Lothian Pathway illustrates what in urban planning is referred to as a desire path. Has anyone heard of this uh, term? A couple of heads nodding. So a desire path in urban planning refers to this kind of situation. If you, if you haven't heard of it, them, and once you do hear of them, when you go, walk around the city at any time, you're going to just start seeing them all over the place. One of my favorites uh, when I go food shopping is I like to go down to the Seaport Market uh, on a Saturday morning, and instead of cutting all the way around, I like to take Morris Street all the way down to the waterfront, walk through the parking lot of the Nova Scotia Power Building, and then there's exactly one of these pathways uh, that will cut across because there's a little bit of grass there. So a desire path in planning means practical ingenuity, when an environment doesn't meet your needs and your wants. And my argument for food policy is that we need to look for the desire paths in people's current food choices in order to have a better idea of the policies that we need to enact. This is because food choices don't happen in a bubble. They don't happen after having reviewed all of the detailed evidence every time you make those 200 food decisions uh, every day. They happen in our communities. They happen in food systems. They happen in stores. They happen when you're commuting to and from work. Uh, they happen when you're running in between classes. This is where food choices happen and this is where we need to look. So to get a little bit further into this, I'm gonna introduce you to three stores and the role they play in their communities and how people are making their food choices that we're working with in our research. So this store is in East Scarborough. It's owned by um, Jan, who's in the picture there. Uh, Jan was a professional engineer. He and his wife, Lucy, came from China. Uh, and what they needed was an entry into the labor market. So this is a food store, but it's not about food. It's about entry into the labor market for a newcomer group. Um, the closest discount supermarket is 1.1 kilometers away. 
This is a store that we worked with in rural Newfoundland and Labrador. It's around Placentia Bay in the community of Branch. Any Newfoundlanders in the house? Yay! <laughs> um, so the closest supermarket to Branch is in Placentia, which is 60 kilometers away, up a harrowing uh, drive on that highway. And St. John's is about two hours away by vehicle. So this store, you might be surprised, this town is home to t about 235 people, 135 households. Uh, but just as recently as a couple of decades ago, there was as many as six small general stores in this community. Now there's just two, and this is one of them. Um, the, this store is a general store because it's not just a store. It's a daily shop, it's a last minute shop, it's a hardware store, it's cleaning supplies, it's where you get your toilet paper when you run out and you didn't go to, you didn't stock up at Costco. It's a post office, it's the tourist stop. It's a restaurant because uh, the cook at the school in the town next, uh, town nearby uh, is working at the restaurant uh, in this community over the summertime. So this is the role that this store plays in this community. This is a store a little bit further away. This is in the Northern Territory in Australia. And this store is run by a group called the Arnhem Land Aboriginal Progress Corporation, or ALPA. ALPA is one of the largest employers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and it's indigenous government. They run 28 stores in the Northern Territory in Northern Queensland. The closest distribution hub to get food to this store is in Darwin, which is 520 kilometers away. And I want you to take a look at this beautiful store. Uh, this is on opening day when I was able to visit. So, with these stores in mind, these are my five policy sets of policy options that I'm gonna ask for when people are coming knocking at my door. The first one is to protect household purchasing power so that people have a decent baseline chance to even shop at these stores. Um, this responds to the issue of food insecurity but is about so much more. Providing food is always a temporary fix but food insecurity is a chronic health condition and it's about income. And we know this will work because we already have a huge basic income program in Canada. And what is it? It's the guaranteed annual income that happens when on your 65th birthday. And research in our proof research program has demonstrated that food insecurity rates can be cut by as much as half as of the 65th birthday in those populations that receive that guaranteed income. And severely food insecure households use more than double the healthcare costs of those that are food secure, so we could do, get that done as well. The second set of policy options is to give municipalities the levers and the budgets they need. This is because municipalities have one of the best chances that we can to plan livable, sustainable, prosperous, and happy communities, including things that we've already talked about, like walkability, green space, transport, and even innovation policy, local economic development policy. So this is also a chance to strengthen those long-lasting foundational policies like regional official plans that are going to be in place for five to 10 to 20 years uh, in some cases, uh, and re-change the food access norms that determine where people shop. The third set of options is retail health promotion. When we usually do nutrition promotion, we're often focusing on the consumer. In this case, the target of health promotion needs to be the retailer. The retailer is themselves a health, uh, is a food purchaser. They're a food supply gatekeeper. They're an employer, a community member. I already showed you some of the other examples of the roles that stores play in communities. We need to level the playing field in terms of the regulatory environment for stores so that stores of any size and in any community have a decent chance to survive and thrive as a rewarding business and a local food provider anywhere in Canada. And this means changing consumption norms as well as changing this huge employer uh, within the labor force. The fourth area is to strengthen science. 
Uh, we want quality, accessible data sources on the food system and food environments, as well as food business and consumption. And we need these to be publicly accessible uh, to academics, as well as uh, anyone who would need this uh, data. We can also strengthen uh, science by having forums for public participation, so that uh, in using this, we can develop evidence-informed policy. And the fifth set of recommendations is finally to use the power of the public purse to leverage the settings and procurement structures we already have where we're purchasing food. We're already spending on money on food, so let's make that food the best that it can be. And the best example of that is currently the Nova Scotia Health Authority's healthy eating policy, which is changing that bar. So in summary, where, why, how do we eat? We do it in communities, we do it in food systems, we do it in public and private institutions, and we do it in the economy. So let's not fix food, let's fix those. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Kathy. Um, so our, our fourth and final speaker for this afternoon is uh, Sarah Sek. Uh, who's a colleague of mine at the law school, an associate professor uh, there, and an associate dean of research um, at the Schulen School of Law at Dalhousie. Uh, her research addresses uh, the relationship between international human rights law, uh, environment, and business law, with a focus on the rights of local and indigenous communities and global south perspectives on sustainable development. Uh, Sarah is the co-editor of a recent volume uh, from Cambridge University Press, on global environmental change and innovation in international law, uh, and she's the co-editor of a recent special issue uh, on uh, resource extraction and human rights of women and girls in the Canadian Journal of Women and the Law. So, uh, Sarah, uh, please, thanks. Maybe I'll leave that there. <laughs> Thank you to the organizers for um, giving me the opportunity to contribute to this um, discussion. Like the first speaker, I don't and haven't thought of myself as a food policy person, and so it's been an interesting exercise for me to think about how the research that I've done in other contexts can contribute to the food policy uh, discussion. And so for this purpose, what I've uh, done is to title my talk, A Relational Approach to Food Policy in a Time of Climate Crisis. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what I mean by a relational approach and why it is that I adopt this approach. And the key claim is that it's very important, I believe, to be aware of what I call the bounded autonomous individual of liberal thought which implicitly underpins constructs and legal doctrines as well as, I think, how we think in policy circles. Um, I draw inspiration from a large number of scholars, feminist legal theorists, ecological vulnerability theorists, um, feminist indigenous scholars, and also feminist international legal theorists um, in my conceptualization of what I call a relational approach. And in previous work, I've considered how a relational approach to domestic and international legal analysis um, and analysis of policy could inform tools for environmental and climate justice in relation to extractive industries. So here, I'm going to make an attempt to apply this relational approach to the food policy context, and we'll see what we come up with. First, I want to share a few key relational insights. So when we speak of any and all individuals, and this includes who the human is, who we think of, who holds the right to food, we must understand that we are all relational and ecologically vulnerable beings. We could think of ourselves in one way as corporeal, corporeal citizens, that's one phrase you see sometimes. Yet we must also understand that individuals are all differentially situated, and so, drawing on Angela Harris's language, we must adopt a principle of humility in our analysis, too. So to explain, even as we are individuals, we are also interdependent beings. We are part of families and communities that are all part of local and global societies and ecosystems. And so ultimately, respect for the integrity of Mother Earth or Earth systems must be central to all that we do. 
And in the food policy context, as already pointed out, it is important to acknowledge that we are quite literally what we eat. At the same time, we're all differentially situated beings. Considerations of race, poverty, indigeneity, disability, gender, youth, and so on, and intersectional dimensions are and should always be crucial to all of our policy discussions. So ultimately, I think food policy must also be about food justice. My first preliminary reflections on Canadian food policy might turn to the Canada Food Guide. So this provides guidance for individuals on healthy nutrition choices, and leaving aside any possible critiques of the substance of the guide or endorsement of it, a relational approach to understanding the individual who is the subject of attention raises, I think, at least the following questions. Might it be problematic that the guide or similar policy documents assume all individuals in Canada have or should have access to the same sources of food? And then secondly, does it matter that this kind of guide arguably treats food as a nutritional commodity without consideration of where the food comes from, how it was grown, harvested, and so its social and ecological footprint? So moving from those insights in, term, in, in applying relational theory to the individual, I want to share some insights um, of applying a relational approach to our understanding of collectives. And here I'm thinking of institutions, collective organizations, this could include international organizations, states, the country of Canada, and businesses. And the key point here is do we also imagine them as bounded autonomous individuals? And so the overarching comments are institutions are all interdependent. They're part of larger systems. Institutions are not unified. They're made up of individuals, even if from a legal perspective, many of them are also legal persons. And Individuals may influence institutions, whether as workers or managers or investors or citizens, just as institutional actions and decisions may impact individuals, both at home and, importantly, abroad. Some further reflections then on implications for food policy. And here I'm going to start with Canada's engagement in international law and policy development. So I ask, should food policy in Canada always explicitly consider and acknowledge Canada's interdependence and embeddedness in international institutions? Canada has obligations under international law, some of which we fail to meet, um, and we're also a contributor to international law and institutions. Are our contributions ones that promote food justice, or are we complicit in perpetuating systems of global food injustice? Some institutions and international initiatives in which Canada is involved and is a key supporter clearly aim to contribute to global and local justice. These include, perhaps, arguably, the UN Environment Program, the work of the Human Rights Council, um, and we can draw on sources of international law which promote principles of intergenerational equity, intragenerational equity, universal human rights, um, the SDGs, we can look to the work of the Food and Agricultural Organization and, and, and be hopeful. And yet, if I draw upon the work of my colleague Carmen Gonzalez in a piece entitled Food Justice, an Environmental Justice Critique of the Global Food System, um, I think we should perhaps also be quite concerned. Uh, Carmen applies an environmental justice focus and proposes a tripartite definition of food justice ecologically sustainable food production, equitable access to food and food producing resources, and democratic and lo local and national control over food and agricultural policy. She then draws an international human rights law and defines food justice as the rights of communities to grow, sell, and consume healthy, nutritious, affordable, and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sustainable methods and their right to democratically determine their own food and agricultural policies. So I ask again, is Canada a supporter of global food justice or a contributor to global food injustice through our participation in other international institutions, such as those associated with trade um, and investment? We can talk about the WTO, World Bank Group, IMF, and others. Um, and are these institutions as Carmen and others might argue, complicit in the violation of the human right to food in a global context? Does Canada's promotion of and formulation of trade policies and practices serve the rights of people to safe, healthy, and ecologically sustainable food production? 
or have global institutions of which Canada is a part undermine the rights of people around the world, including within Canada, leading to the displacement and disempowerment of small-scale farmers in the global south and north, and we could include fishers here as well, and consequently a lack of access to food for those who've been marginalized or worse by our system of global trade, global food trade. The consequence of the injustices, I think, is that we see and have been seeing a bottom-up emergence of food sovereignty movements across the globe which embrace the language of human rights right to food, food justice, um, food sovereignty. And we have seen um, in one of the documents circulated uh, before this talk, also um, reference to how the Inuit in Canada have been embracing this language of food sovereignty. So here I wanna quickly transition to some reflections on climate change. Um, the Inuit have also been leaders in promoting this idea that climate change is a human rights um, issue. In 2005, Sheila Wakluche led a petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And uh, at the time, it was difficult to make the claim, but now it is much more universally acknowledged that climate change and human rights are intertwined. And we have several reports from this summer um, from UN Special Rapporteurs who, who are um, clarifying the nature of that relationship. So, I would claim that a troubling undercurrent to all we do these days is or should be, unfortunately, climate crisis. Not only is Canada not close to meeting our emissions target, which are woefully inadequate, we don't and have not seriously internalized what it would mean to take seriously the reality of a global carbon budget. And we also haven't linked this to our food policy. So also this summer, the IPCC released a report on um, sustainable land management and food security and greenhouse gas emissions. And yet I don't see references or clear linkages in recent federal government policy development between food and climate. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about food. I'm saying we should talk about climate in relation to food and food and climate together. Um, and so, so I think there's a lot more we could do in that area and more we need to do. Um, my last reflection is just going to note um, some thoughts on businesses as institutions, and I recognize my time is up, <laughs> but I just wanna add, add this. A lot of my work is focused on extractive industries, and there's a tremendous civil society uh, movement in the Canadian context to shame Canadian mining companies operating in other countries um, and to draw attention to human rights and environmental rights violations in those contexts. And there have been government policy responses as a result. But we don't see any of that, I believe, really, in the agricultural context. And so I wonder if there's something that we can and should be doing here. Um, the recent, the OECD has been very active in producing responsible business conduct guidance tools. One of their most recent ones is on agricultural supply chains. There is now in Canada a highly criticized and weak ombudsperson for responsible uh, business conduct um, abroad, but the issue areas that are the focus of this ombuds work right now are extractives and the garment sector. Uh, my policy recommendation then is that I think we need to think about what lessons we can draw from other industry sectors take seriously that our discussions of food must also be linked to climate crisis, unfortunately, and take seriously our global responsibilities as well as our local. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah, and uh, thanks to all of our uh, panelists, uh, both for uh, keeping the time and, and for uh, providing us with uh, so much to think about. So maybe just one more round of applause for the panel as a whole. Um, it's, I think it's a very exciting time at Dalhousie in particular. Uh, and as you can see from the panel, um, we have some of the leading lights in thinking about food and food policy um, across the country and internationally. Um, and so for those 
who are interested and concerned um, in food, about food system issues, um, I think this is an extraordinarily exciting place uh, to be at the current moment. Um, so uh, for the rest of the time we've got available, I want to be able to um, have some questions for the panel. Uh, so the practice uh, of these panels um, uh, is going to be that I'm going to turn to some students uh, in the policy class who prepared some questions and delve down into some of the issues uh, first. Uh, there's three of those, and then I'll open it up uh, to the rest of the room uh, to ask uh, questions. So. Um, okay, so um, maybe I'll ask uh, Shaylon if you want to ask your question first. Thanks. I think there's a portable mic. Hi, everyone. I want to thank everybody for attending today, and thanks to speakers for their engaging with some of the talks. Um, and also, I want to thank Professor Kirk for letting us uh, participate in this uh, speaker series. My question would be for Professor Kirk. As there is a so I know the mic is actually not for the room, it's for the Facebook, so if you can't hear the question, I'll try to repeat it after it's been asked, okay? As there's a shortage of primary family physicians in Nova Scotia, and individuals will likely to continue to be improperly educated on health literacy, such as Canada's Food Guide, uh, what alternative strategies can government or communities implement to fill this gap? So the question was regarding a shortage of family physicians um, in the province of the region, uh, their educative role around food, and what can be done as a matter of policy to fill the gap for Professor Kirk. Okay, thank you very much. Um, great question. Um, so I think the things that, that I was talking about earlier, I think all of us have a role to play in actually addressing this. Um, the healthcare or health sickness care system really doesn't have the capacity to do a lot of the upstream work that we're talking about. Um, and so I think really um, mobilizing our own uh, networks, um, our own interests in these things is really important. And uh, so I think I, I, that's what I would suggest that we need to be doing is that each of us in this room needs to be the voice to, to actually take this message out. And those things about reclaiming, um, you know, uh, food is a human right, um, and really rec reconnecting where, with where our food come from, I think is really important. Thanks. Ashley, go ahead. Hi, thanks again for um, your lectures. That was really informative. Um, so my question is for Professor Bailey. Um, Touch on this briefly at the end of your um, lecture, and I'm just sort of wondering, so in the Canadian food policy that was just released, there is no mention of aquaculture or fisheries. Mm -hmm. So where within that, like how would you like to see that addressed and implemented? Um, should it be included in that food policy or should it just be a separate thing? Would that muddle the issue? Um, so what is your opinion on that? Thanks for that. Um, I want to touch on, I think, something that um, Sarah mentioned in her talk about a lack of um, consideration for like the social or the ecological production dimensions of the food that does get recommended. Um, so when we look at a lot of the crises that we've had in fisheries across Canada and, and globally, because also we get more than half of our seafood not from Canada. So 80% of probably what we see on store shelves in terms of fish and seafood has come from elsewhere. Um, so there's a lot of unsustainable fisheries out there and there's zero consideration in the food guide and, and in food recommendations around seafood of the sustainability dimensions of that. So we, we have this weird thing where we recommend salmon, for example, in a lot of cases because it's very healthy. Um, but where's that salmon supposed to come from? So there's also a huge conversation around the environmental impacts of farming Atlantic salmon. And this year, Pacific sockeye are less than 10% of what the predicted run was gonna be um, for sockeye returns. So there's this real kind of mismatch between health guidelines and where that fish and seafood is supposed to come from. Um, and so sustainability is really important, but then also is the fact that um, the ecological basis for a fishery is not the only thing that we really want to think about, right? It, it's a, who's fishing that fish, so who has access um, to be out on the water, who has priority. Um, are those fishermen within communities that we're trying to support? So what's kind of that, the social justice related to the fishery? Um, and so again, that's not considered either. So in some ways I don't mind a lack of specificity around recommendations because it's actually really complicated to say like what's the best fish and seafood to eat? It really depends on what you value. 
right? Do you value a local product? Do you value um, a certified product? Uh, what matters to you? So a culturally appropriate product? Um, so how do we make a recommendation that's species specific? Um, but at the same time, when we leave it open, then we also don't have a lot of guidance of what kind of decision um, should one be making. So it's kind of an ambiguous answer. Um, but I do think at least one thing we need to do is start creating a conversation around the sustainable basis for food recommendations. Um, both ecological sustainability, but also social and economic sustainability as well. It, that's something I'd like to see. I have a master's student kind of working in that space right now and finding it really difficult um, to find any evidence that those kinds of decisions go into uh, food recommendations. Thank you for your question. Can I just add to that? Um, because I think the other issue as well um, is the, the issue of you know, the fruit and vegetables um, that we should be eating more of <laughs> because we're not growing enough in uh, Canada to actually even be able to do that. So, and I think even globally might be the, the case. You know, so these are recommendations that are almost impossible to actually achieve even if we were um, going to increase our consumption. to thank the panel. Um, my question that I want to ask is about access and consumption of food in Canada in relation to global trade. Um, and it's specifically for Professor Ma. Um, so with globalized agribusiness increasing on the world stage in Canada, importing a prominent share of its fruits and vegetables from South and Central America, um, should the government reassess its allocation of produce and reinvest in such things as uh, CSA, community supported agriculture boxes, or providing direct incentives for citizens to go down to the seaport market, um, or is agribusiness and globalized accessibility too entrenched in today's kind of world of globalized trade that we can consume anything that we want at any point that attempting to readdress how we access consumption and access our produce sectors that in modern for modern day Canadians it's a fruitless endeavor. Okay. That <laughs> That's the easy one. <laughs> so the my answer uh, to your question thanks for the question uh, is it's not, it's not an either or, it's an and. Uh, and my, sometimes when I uh, do a panel and I answer questions, it sounds like I want it all. I want the <laughs> global, uh, I want global trade in food and I want a diverse and resilient local food system. But I genuinely want both of those <laughs> things because I think that they fulfill uh, very different needs. Uh, economically as well as when it comes to diets and consumption. So to the extent that, let's say, the direction that I wouldn't recommend is more standardization or less diversity or more vertical consolidation because those are homogenizing forces uh, in the food system and we need policies that protect the heterogeneity and diversity in our food system and that would be my priority. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thanks very much uh, for those initial questions to get us uh, started. So I'm now going to open it up to the room. Uh, the only ground rule for the questions uh, in the session is that you have to direct your question to one of the particular panelists. Um, otherwise, you get four questions for the price of one. Uh, and so to give everyone a chance, uh, direct your question to a specific panelist. If there are others who have something to say on it, then they're, of course, free and welcome to chime in. Um, so I'm just going to give you just a few seconds to think and contemplate about what you've heard so far. Um, uh, put your hand up if you have a question for the panel, and then we'll come around with the mic. Hi, my name's Logan Lawrence. Uh, I'm a PhD health candidate here at Dalhousie. Uh, my question is actually to uh, Dr. Bailey. Um, so you mentioned that one of the questions you're kind of grappling with is, you know, when does fish policy become food policy? And many of the complex policy issues we're running up against are when we have two different areas and we realize like we can't only look at it from one perspective. Can you tell us if you know of any good examples from like other policy areas or ones in food or fish policy where two different policy areas are able to talk about the same problem and work together to address them? No, <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's not true. So um, I will say that I think food is the perfect place to do that, actually. Um, so, so it should be being done. I, if I think about the province, um, so if we just think about Nova Scotia, for example, and you think about food, and so 
uh, three years ago when I first started chatting about this stuff, um, we had a panel that was one fish talk and three uh, agricultural talks. And it was really interesting because all the questions were about farming and this and like romanticizing like small farms and um, and you know someone made a comment about the fact that the the fisheries economy in this province is like I don't know 20 times the land-based agricultural um, production uh, the value from that so we all kind of we don't see the fishing we don't kind of think about that and we don't get a lot of local seafood here so there was all this big kind of you know emphasis on agriculture. Um, and so just uh, that kind of recognition of how limited fish plays into food conversations and even in a couple of people's talks, I, like, it's always kind of land-based, you know? And so if we think about more of an integrated food system, and I know that there's, you know, it's not a po at a policy level, but the Ecology Action Center was working on kind of an Atlantic food systems mapping. Um, where you can't ignore fish, for example, right? It, it, it doesn't even make sense. Um, so I think food is the perfect place to do that, to kind of bring different production systems together into a food system, because all of this food ends up on, on your store shelves or on your plate, um, if, you know, depending on what you eat. Um, so I think that there's a lot of potential there. I don't see it happening a lot, because I still see a lot of, um, a lot of trade push, particularly in this province, for exporting, doubling the value of exports. Um, you know, our provincial ministers, our federal ministers take tons of trips overseas to try to work on global markets for our products. They're not making trips to communities to try to work on community consumption um, of products that we produce. Um, and so, yeah, this, yeah, I, I will look to my other wonderful um, panelists if they do mind chiming in on examples that they have, yeah. So. I want to share an example from the Canadian Mining Companies Operating Internationally uh, context. So I said we do, or I may have gotten to the point of saying that in 2009 we adopted, the Canadian government uh, adopted and started promoting um, a corporate social responsibility policies for Canadian extractive companies operating internationally. This was the outcome of a roundtables process that happened in 2006 where I understand from internal government people for the very first time members of different government departments sat down. So Natural Resources Canada sat down with Environment Canada, sat down with Indigenous and Northern Affairs, sat down with Investment Canada, da 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 da. And the curious part is at the end of this roundtables process, and there was an advisory group which had industry and NGOs on it, the industry and NGOs essentially kicked out the government people and came to a consensus report because government was hopeless. They couldn't figure out how to communicate and come to any kind of consensus. So there's a problem <laughs> in terms of government departments getting down their silos and going crazy and not talking to each other. Um, and then the outcome of that is we have this, these CSR policies that are promoted to Canadian mining companies operating internationally, and very few people have, people have clued into the fact that these policies actually also apply to Canadian mining companies operating in Canada. And for a long time, the, the, the uh, federal, various federal departments would have said, oh, no, no, this is for outside of Canada. We do everything perfectly here. And so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know we're not supposed to do this. <laughs> I, I also think it depends on how you're going to run your cabinet. So I, 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 I'm still kind of thinking about this. So, you know, if it's in your, it, it, there's a decision on who's going to be the minister who's going to head up that portfolio. So then, um, so, but when that happens, is it in the, the mandate letter are also that you explicitly need to collaborate with X, Y, and Z other uh, ministries? Or are you going to run your cabinet in the way that it's a series of little fiefdoms uh, over issue areas? And if that's mm -hmm. going to be how it is, then that's not going to work for the food issues that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Let me just, I just want to one to brief on what Kathy said, because I, I think it's really interesting, you know, this idea about that food pushes us to actually govern in different ways, right? Think structurally about the way that we make policy as opposed to what we just, we put in policy. And, and Kathy actually made the point earlier that, you know, she wants to see more focus on what local governments are doing. And, and they, I think, are appearing as laboratories for exactly this kind of collaborative governance thinking, right? Partly because they're a little bit more flexible sometimes to do that work. Um, and you see, you know, them working with, and to draw on Sarah's example, you know, other stakeholders, people in civil society, actors in civil society, uh, private sector and so forth, policies being made in a very different way, and I think that's a cool example that we might think about how we scale up. Yeah, um, yeah please over here. Hi, 
Hi, thank you again. Um, this, this question is for Professor Kirk. Um, you and your team identified in your article um, uh, marketing and advertising as a sub-theme um, in the food culture theme in the interventional intervention level framework. Um, I know there's been a lot of recent developments in marketing and advertising for um, food, specifically with children and TV commercials. Um, I was just wondering if you had any updates on, on what the most recent policies are, uh, specifically if there's any um, Nova Scotia, Atlantic Canada policies for um, for advertising, and if you think that it's enough, and where the kind of future of marketing for food and children is going to kind of head, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think what you were saying is you need to, uh, 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 like provincial level um, policies around marketing, was that right? Yeah, because there aren't any. <laughs> um, and we don't even, I, um, well, there is moves federally to start looking at these things. Um, but it's a really it's a really difficult issue because um, you know it, it's something that we don't really think about. Um, the food industry does have quite a strong voice and it's quite a powerful player in the whole food policy um, realm anyway. Um, and yeah, but it, absolutely we need to be protecting our most vulnerable members of society. Uh, we see provincially um, really Quebec is the only um, jurisdiction ha that has has done this well um, and uh, so I would love to see more of that it's certainly conversations that, that I have with some people within the the um, sort of government realm but uh, nothing's actually happened or yeah come down the pipe from that yeah um, hi um, uh, this question is for Dr. Ma, and um, I'm very new to Canada, so I just um, think of a, a problem that is um, uh, if you have cheap food um, without some vegetables, uh, may, uh, it may lack of some uh, vitamins, so it can lead to a problem of uh, a healthy Maybe you have the cardiovascular problems and um, diabetes rate goes up, and then the the, the low incomers can't uh, can't afford um, to work during their bad health condition, and thus they become um, uh, lower in the the income. So um, it, it goes a bad circle, a vicious circle. So where can you break it? How can you break the, the, the vicious circle? Thanks for your question. So, um, you know, as was my first recommendation, the bottom line is we, you, need, you need adequate income to purchase food, but the issue of uh, adequate income is also separate from the issue of the affordability of food as well as the price of food. And those are all three separate things that I would encourage us to think quite differently about when it comes to food policy. Uh, and that's because, the do, do we actually know that uh, healthy food costs more than unhealthy food? I think you would think you know the answer, but we actually don't know that for Canada yet, uh, especially. Uh, so, a simple example of this is in our research, we do audits in the store environment. And if you look at the store environment, and if you even do something just as simple as changing the unit of measure, if you're measuring price, food prices in dollars per 1,000 kilocalories, what's gonna be the expensive food? So energy cost. That's fruits and vegetables. They're very expensive when it comes to energy. Uh, and that's a food security and that's relevant in the, de the international development context. But if you think about, but if you change the unit of measure and you do dollars per serving, dollars per nutrients, dollars per kilo or even the sticker price that you see, uh, some of the higher priced items uh, in any given store audit will be things like cheese. Cheese is one of the highest mm -hmm. kind of dollar per kilo uh, items in the store. So I think, again, like, I guess the theme of this panel is thinking differently about food to make f good food policy. And I would say the same thing about uh, 
ad having adequate income, but also addressing food prices in the food environment. Um, this question is for Dr. Kirk. I'm curious of what you think the future is um, in relation to pharmaceutical companies and prescribing healthy diets, because often you see that you can walk out of the doctor's office with a prescription to lower your cholesterol or X, Y, or Z, when ultimately a lot of things can be solved through changing your diet, changing your activity levels. And um, yeah, what's the relation between that? Like, what's the future for it? Oh my gosh, that's a really great question. Um, uh, I have to think about that, I think, for a minute. but. Um, uh, it certainly has worked for something like physical activity. Prescribing um, exercise for medicine uh, is medicine, for example, is a, a, a big movement in Canada and elsewhere. Um, <laughs> that is such a complex thing, though, because you know there's no one component. There's lots of multiple things, and there's interactions between different foods. Um, but I do often talk about a dose of health promotion. Um, and so more, you know, you're talking specifically diet. I, I would argue that uh, there are many things that we could be doing at a better dose than we do at the moment around um, health promotion. And, uh, but we have to then reflect on how much money goes into health promotion. And it's a tiny, tiny mm -hmm. fraction of the entire budget that goes into sickness care. Um, so if you, and I keep using that, that phrase because I really want us to get our heads around the fact that when you have a budget um, that's 98% treating illness and 2% or less than 2% treating health, we've got a problem. So uh, yeah, so I think I would, I would consider framing it more around, you know, again, um, uh, prescribing healthy behaviors more generically than, than just around food. Yeah. And I don't know whether anybody else wants to add to that, Kathy. <laughs> This is like kind of out there, so sorry. <laughs> um, but I had read this book on like financial independence for women or something. It was like financial literacy. Or one of the starting activities was to write down what you value. And you had to like kind of get this into five key values. So it might be like family and relationships and health. And then look at your spending for a month and see where you spend in relation to those values. Don't do it if you are like <laughs> sensitive or I like it was I oh my gosh I, I, was, I was really blown away with where I spend my money versus where I say my values are and so I think that kind of exercise like but I don't know if we can do that nationally or globally but also even just on an individual level um, and think about that because I think and not to I mean I get the issue of like don't just tell people to eat not eat the burger or whatever but um, you know we do we really spend our money in really poor places and I Someone was on the CBC last week or the week before talking about how low, um, uh, low proportion of our income we spend on food versus in other places. They might spend half of their income on food. And for us, I don't know what's 5% or 10% or something. Somebody has the actual number. It's quite small. Um, so <laughs> what, like, how is it that we can, you know, either through nudging and like those system level changes, but encourage people that money can be spent in really different ways? And, and why are we not spending more money on um, the things that we really say we value as individuals or as a society, both like at the political level and also at your individual purchasing level. Sorry, I'll, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just add to that. That's the idea. <laughs> Again, values for money rather than, yeah, yeah. you know, value for money. I like that. So just for a brief reflection on the price of food, I think the key question which we don't ask is does the price reflect food justice? Um, who are the people who are making, farming, producing the food? Who was kicked off their land to produce that food? Um, what are the ecological consequences for the people who are living close to that area of our food choices? And if our prices don't reflect all of those externalities, and they don't, then that's another problem that we actually should care about, although we tend to ignore it. On average, a Canadian households spend 1.7 oh. times as much on meat as they do on vegetables. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think we'll have time for at least one more question, um, if not two, so please. Hi, my name's Ann Fox, and I'm the chair of the Department of Human Nutrition at St. FX. I happened to be in town today and thought I'd drop by, so good timing on my part. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talks. I just want to make a comment that follows up to um, both your comment about prescriptions and the comment about family physicians. 
I moved to Nova Scotia about three years ago, and I've been really struck by um, the underutilization in this province of an incredible resource that we have a lot of, and that's dietitians. So right now, we have a, a health profession who can write prescriptions, um, and many of them are going to other provinces to work, even though we train a huge number of the dietitians that work in Canada. And while our focus is on um, the shortage of family physicians, um, the Dietitian Act has been held up for 10 years. It's been written, it's on the books, and it hasn't been passed. And therefore, the scope of practice for the main health profession in this province who promotes nutrition um, is not as broad and extensive as it is in almost every other province and territory in the country. Um, so I would advocate that it would be advantageous to the healthcare system if we relieved family physicians of some of their burden, and let's face it, they don't have the time to get into nutrition. Um, and we have an incredible source of food advocacy, community advocacy, um, here that we're not optimizing um, as we could in this province, and which other provinces have done, in my view, a better job of. So I'd just like to throw that out there. I don't know if any of the, the other panelists um, want to comment. I'm not trying to make this a plug for dietitians, but merely in, <laughs> I guess I do, uh, <laughs> uh, because I'm a proud one. But um, also it's been a, you know, it's a slough, uh, tough uh, slog in advocating for the profession. I will um, answer that one or, or respond to that one because I, I, as a, I trained as a dietitian, um, the only, well, the main reason I'm not one here in Canada is because I would have had to sit an exam to do it, <laughs> um, and my research area was more broad, so I, you know, I, I let that go. But as a, as an ex-dietitian, I totally agree with you, and I think that's a really interesting. Again, some of those, that's a systems level issue that we're facing here around, you know, we, you know, the big concern of most Nova Scotians is access to a family physician. Well, again, Dalhousie, we train all sorts of other professions. We have um, the nutrition programs that, that are, are trained elsewhere in, in, um, in, uh, in Nova Scotia as well. Um, we need to do a much better job, really, of, of all those other things. And that's a whole different panel. <laughs> but uh, but the, the way that we even set up our health system is not optimal, really, based on the, on the, the skill sets that are available. Okay, uh, this will be our final question for the day, so go ahead. Yes. Um, so this is kind of a question to go to the last question that was just asked and um, to uh, Sarah Beck, who just uh, answered uh, the question. Um, so my understanding is that I completely agree that it would be great to alleviate the responsibility of doctors or physici family physicians and for dietitians to be, um, uh, you know, play their role and uh, tell people how to manage their diet and whatnot. Um, however, I, I, from my understanding, you'd have to pay to go see a dietitian. Is that correct? Um, it's, oh, it's not. Okay, so it would just be free, like any family physician kind of thing. Oh, well, in that case, then <laughs> sounds like you have a solution. <laughs> so then, so is there anyone have one last question they want to ask to the panel? Um, so, related to the food guide as a tool for policy, I'm wondering if, um, I guess anyone can answer this question if you'd like, um, it's not a prescriptive document as it was previously, and I think people often have um, problems engaging in change and how to interpret that change. So I'm wondering if you can discuss a little bit about how um, you might see different industries or different people interacting with a guide that's less prescriptive and more um, interpretive based on culture, place, um, and all those kinds of things um, as a policy tool that's really changing the face of what Canadians understand as policy and how to engage with it. I'll just start. 
I think, I think the main thing is baking it into other things that we already do. That's sort of my first and favorite answer, which is if the Nova Scotia uh, Health Authority is looking at all of its foods and its uh, retail food outlets, you know, it's a huge workplace. Uh, some hospitals, the employees are having two and three meals there uh, in a day. Then if the food guide is already baked into all the food supply in that workplace, then any individual person doesn't have to think about uh, that. And a diversity of options can be offered because that's a procurement at an institutional scale. I'll, I'll just add, um, w right before the, the food guide was announced, um, CBC had gone around and kind of asked people just on the street in Halifax, you know, did they know about Canada's food guide? And, and I don't know how they selected who they played on, on the air. You always have to wonder. But people were like, nope, never heard of it, no idea. You know? <laughs> and then, but it was really interesting because then they reported that it's like the second most downloaded document <laughs> from the government of Canada. And also, this one person was kind of commenting on it being Canada's unconscious conscience or something like that, food conscience, because of how it gets picked up in procurement. And so whether as an individual, how much do you need to know versus all of the food that's available at all the institutions that you probably don't think about what's available here on campus. And there are policies that guide what, what is available for you to even buy. So part of that individual choice is totally taken away from you in public settings. Um, so it was, it was a really interesting, I hadn't really thought about it, but um, I don't know how many people are confused. I don't know how many people actually visit that food guide and think about it um, versus how much it's just taken into our institutional decision making um, and if that's where it matters more. I was told by a senator once that he does all the grocery shopping and he was very mad that it was less descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to <laughs> work him up on it. <laughs> uh, so I'm conscious of the time. Um, uh, that's all the time we'll have for, for questions today. I just want to make a comment to close off the panel that what I think has been so great about this event is, is you know, if you take this kind of central um, question of the panel about you know, what does food bring as a lens to, to good policy, um, the, the panelists are, I think, are all grappling with that question in a very real way, right? And I think we get that all too well, like rarely in some ways in these settings, and I really see it kind of peeling out in, in the worries and, and, and it, that people have around that lens, but also the power that they see it you know, giving to good policy. So I want to thank uh, the panelists for all their engagements and, and all their thoughts and insight today. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Wimby, one last uh, round of applause. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs>